staff, probably preached one of the uh, maybe three or four worst messages I've ever preached in my life, just because I was trying to preach a holiday message and so forth. And it really leaves me out of my own. I prefer to preach through the Scripture and uh, help with explaining Scripture. But preaching, like, oh, you got to talk about this, is just that's just not me. There, there are preachers that that's what they do every week. It's what they're gifted at, and I'm ungifted at it. But uh, this week is a little bit different because we're preaching about something that really is who we are as in our identity as believers, and this is really uh, one of the most important, one of the most important. Um, well, not one of the most important. most important thing that ever happened in the world is that Jesus Christ came. So I want to focus on that this morning. I'll look at some fulfillments of some prophecies of the Scripture and, and draw some application from it. And I hope as a, as a believer this morning as well, I'll just equip you a little bit, give you some answers uh, to questions that people have or answers that maybe you've asked and didn't have an answer for. And uh, we just want to look at uh, some truths, what it means, what it means that Jesus came. What does it mean that Jesus came? And so uh, I would actually like to just just read, I said Matthew chapter 2, but I'd like to just, before we get into our text this morning, we'll kind of preach through that, I'd like to read for our context this morning, beginning of verse 18 of chapter 1 of Matthew, and uh, just the story of Jesus Christ and Christmas. And please set aside the, you know, the Christi Christmas traditions that aren't Jesus and Jesus Christ coming. You know, Christmas means so many pe things to so many people. Have you noticed, like if you watch a Christmas movie, uh, that the Christmas movie is usually about what Christmas is about for people, what it means to you. Well, Christmas is Christ coming, Jesus Christ's birth, and that's what we celebrate. And that's the big deal about this time of the year, is that Jesus Christ is born. Can you imagine having a birthday that people celebrated, and what they celebrated and what, the, your, birth, what your birthday meant to them had nothing to do with you? It would be a nice party, I guess, but not really significant when it comes to the most significant event ever. Verse 18 of chapter 1. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Uh, then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. Uh, but while he thought on these things, behold... The angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost, and, and she shall bring forth a son. And thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that he might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted as God with us. That's Isaiah chapter 7 that the Scripture references here in verse 24. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and called his name Jesus. Father, please help us today, not only with our understanding, but ultimately, God, for the application of the significance of the reality that Jesus came. Please, God, today, by the help of your Holy Spirit, uh, I just pray that you would just convince us of truths in such a practical way that we would be settled ourselves, but not only that, that we would be able to share and to show others these great truths, and we just ask it, all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. But I'd like to focus on today, kind of a continuation of where we were at in our teen Sunday school the last couple of weeks. Uh, I'd like to focus on today the fulfillment of the prophecies of Jesus Christ, the things that proved that He was God. And I know many of us, you know, have looked at these things, but we need to intimately know. You know, if someone asks you uh, or tells you that Jesus was not God, you as a believer ought to know for yourself why Jesus is God, how, he's, how you know that He's God. And secondarily, you ought to be able to share with somebody, hey, explain this, if Jesus is not God. Uh, I was speaking uh, last... Yeah, it was last week I was speaking with some friends that are Muslim, and they were telling me uh, how wonderful uh, Islam's inclusion of Jesus Christ is. And so they told me, you know, we have chapters in the Quran about Mary, about stories about Mary that you've never heard of before. I said, well, I have heard of them. I've read those chapters in the Quran. But the, you know, and, and we didn't get into that discussion. It wouldn't have been kind, I don't think, if we had. 
but the reality of it is that the things that were said in the Quran about Mary were so made up and so fanciful and so impossible geographically and so forth and genetically. In other words, she was the wrong person in the wrong place to be Mary. And so, obviously, those prophecies don't do much. And then, oh, well, you know, the Quran says really nice things about Jesus because the Quran says that Jesus is a prophet. Well, it's nice, uh, you know, to get the recognition, I suppose, for Jesus, but Jesus is God. And uh, he's more than a prophet. Some people in Jesus' day said he's Elijah. No, he wasn't. John the Baptist was Elijah. Uh, some people had, you know, you are this person. You someone come back from the dead. This is who people say that you are. But the reality of it is that Jesus is God. And if Jesus isn't, a, isn't God, then he isn't anybody of any significance to anyone. In other words, the whole notion that uh, Jesus Christ was this good human figure that did so many good things that He changed the world and that His teachings influenced so many people for good. My friend, I'll just be honest with you, there are, that's just, that just puts Christianity in a lump of any religion that has some good things about it. Just a religion, that's all it is. If Jesus isn't God, then uh, nothing that, he, that anyone claims about Him has any kind of significance, at least for me. And I'll be quite frank with you, I don't enjoy religion. I'm not a religious person or personality. I'm not the kind of per person that likes ritual. I think ritual's spooky, a little bit scary. I just don't like it. And uh, I, don't like, I don't like religious people, to be quite frank with you, because they're always pretending to be better than somebody or better than something. And they're usually trying to use their religion to manipulate. Usually trying to get you to you know, think something about them so that you know, they would have an advantage of some sort because of it. Or they're trying to get you to do something for them or uh, give them something because of religion. And I just can't stand that. I don't like people using the, you know, the, re, the uh, you know, I'm, I'm a Christian thing to get benefits from it and so forth. It frustrates me. I can't stand, uh, this is a little bit rant. I can't stand uh, pastors that throw around, I'm a pastor to people, like you should get a discount for it or something. Or uh, you should, uh, you should uh, not. I remember one time I was taking a guy uh, who was he was a, a he was a missionary, and I was picking him up from the airport. No, he was picking me up from the airport, and he, he was waiting outside. You're not supposed to wait outside. You're supposed to park somewhere. You're not supposed to park in front of the terminals for security purposes. And so he told me when I picked him up, he said, "Yeah." He said the sheriff came up and said that I should uh, that that I needed to move, but I told him I was waiting for a pastor. <laughs> what does that have to do with anything? A pastor says, you know, you can, you know, you can uh, break security protocol, things that are uh, wrong for everybody else, but it's okay because you're a pastor. That's what religion's like in a lot of ways, isn't it? It's, uh, I can do this and I'm very unjustified because, and I'll be quite frank with you, I wouldn't darken the doors of a church if Jesus wasn't God. And that's the reality of it. If the Holy Spirit of God did not live in me and speak to me, and if I did not know that the Bible was God's Word, I wouldn't play the silly game of religion for it. And I don't think anybody ought to, to be honest with you. It's disingenuous, it's dishonest, it's manipulative, manipulative, and it's probably one of the greatest evils in the world. You remember what Jesus said about our righteousnesses? He says they're filthy rags. In other words, good works are religions. Jesus said are just despicable in the eyes of God because what they try to say to God is God I'm good and therefore I do not need anything. You ought to accept me as I am. And that's what religion does. Religion says God here's what I am and here's why you should accept it. But he's God, remember. And uh, what God accepts is sinlessness. And religion can't do that. Religion just tries to substitute good works and overlook sin because of it. Okay, so what is the significance uh, of Christ's birth of Christmas? Well, the reality of it is that for 4,000 years, for 4,000 years from the time that the first man, Adam, sinned, man has had a problem, and that is that God is his natural enemy. Of course, when we're born, when I was born, the Bible says I was born dead in trespasses and sins. So when I was born, by my very person, my very nature, my very character, 
I was a sinner. And you know, I didn't even, I, I, I had probably some good sinful parents, but you know, I was pretty exceptional on my own without any training. You know, some parents I think train their kids to sin by either good examples of things you shouldn't do or by uh, maybe just ways that they raise their children or some parents actually teach their kids to do bad things. There are parents that use their children uh, to steal or to be dishonest or whatever. And that's probably the rare exception. Nobody taught me how to lie. Did you know that? My parents weren't like, well, you know what, in this household, uh, lying is something that we really admire and something we try to develop as a character trait. And so I want to, you know, want to just teach you. My dad did sit me down and say, now, son, I've been lying to your mom for a long time and I've gotten pretty good at it, so I want to give you some pointers. You know, the fact of the matter is, is that I lied to my mom on my own without needing any pointers from my dad. I remember this. I've probably told you this story before. But I remember... Uh, I can remember being pretty young. I have My brother and I both have pretty young memories. I can remember back to about two years old. I remember we lived in a little house in Headville, Kansas, and I was probably two and a half at the time. I wasn't counting my age at the time, but I, I know because of chronological events in my life when this was. And I remember that we had in our house, we didn't we really didn't have a lot of sweets and treats in our house. We usually had pretty healthy food, I guess, most of the time. And we had powdered sugar donuts, a box of Hostess powdered sugar donuts, and we had strawberries, a nice packet of fresh strawberries, and I remember them very well to this day. And it was probably, it was, I know it had been summertime because of the late evenings, but it was very, very bright daylight, and I told my mom, I said, I think I'm going to go to bed. I don't go to bed on my own today. I never have my entire life, but I said, I think I'm going to go to bed. And mom said, well, Ryan, it's still light outside. It's not, it's not bedtime yet. You don't have to go to bed. I said, I just think, I think I'm going to go to bed. So I did. went to bed. Of course, my mom, you know, being a little more educated about lying thieves, uh, knew I was up to something. And so she came upstairs, and she checked my room. And I had, under my bed, I had the box of donuts, the powdered sugar donuts, and the strawberries. And I had a wet washcloth because I was going to wipe my face off after I got powdered sugar all over I was going to cover up the deal. Now that's pretty conniving for a two and something year old, isn't it? And the reality of it is I remember doing that. I remember what happened after I did that too. And uh, I just think about it today and I think, you know, at two and a half years old I was a lying thief. Because in our house you didn't just go take food, you got food when it was given to you. And so I was stealing it. I stole the food. And I lied about the reason that I was going to bed. And at two and a half years old, I was just as sinful as I can be. Uh, maybe, maybe today we laugh, we think that's cute, but actually the fact that matters is if that's your kid, it's a problem, isn't it? Because you've got a lying thief on your hands and nobody taught me to do that. That was naturally occurring in me and that's because I'm a sinner. The reality of it is, is that that's the truth for all of us, isn't it? You've told lies and if you say you haven't, you're lying about it. I've, I don't know how many times that I have tried to share the gospel with somebody, and it's just like, it's great when there's a husband and a wife there, or a parent and children. Because they always rat each other out, they always tattle on each other. And I've before uh, just asked the person, said, you know, I'm trying to give them the gospel, and they don't see their need for a Savior unless they recognize that they've sinned against God. And so I've had people tell me, well, you know, I'm, I'm not a sinner. I don't sin. And I'll ask them, so you ever told a lie? <coughs> no, I don't lie. You're taking something that belongs to you? No. And then I always look to the spouse and I say, is that true? They might believe, I mean, sometimes you tell a lie and you believe your lie. They might believe it, but their spouse does. You ever ask a kid, does mom and dad ever lose their temper? Is that, have they ever, just ask a kid. Say, well, your kids think you're a sinner. How's that? What's the deal there? Now I ask the spouse, what do you think? And they start, you know, going at each other. Sometimes you're going to step back a little bit and have... You know, wife tells on husband, husband tells on wife, and starts, you know, going back and forth and so forth. But the reality of it is we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Genesis chapter 3. Let's turn there in our Bibles really quickly, shall we? Genesis chapter 3. This is right after Eve had tricked Adam into sinning. No, not really. The Bible says that that Eve was deceived, and Adam, uh, Adam, uh, he was in, in, in the transgression. In other words, he made a choice to sin. Genesis chapter 3, and I'd like to just look at something. I'd like to analyze it. When you read the Bible and something doesn't make sense, it's not only because there's something that God is trying to teach you that will make a lot of sense if you'll educate yourself about it. This would be one of those passages of Scripture. 
And in verse 14, this is after the, the Eve said the serpent beguiled her, she deceived me, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And then notice verse 15, this is where I want to come to. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. I'm amazed at the day in which we live, at how much enmity between mankind and Satan there actually is not. Did you know that the fastest growing religion in the world right now is Satanism? In all of its offshoots, all of its off branches. Not many countries have very, very direct Satanism, not so much in the United States. But if you were to go, say, to Cuba, of course, Santeria would be something that would be a very, very popular religion there, and that's just open worship of Satan. If you go to, to uh, Haiti, for instance, you would see open worship, uh, voodoo, which is open worship of Satan. In the United States of America, witchcraft is actively, uh, actively practiced and actually being taught uh, as just an alternate education. And the fact of the matter is, is that the witchcraft has grown in the United States of America at astronomical rates. Many, many people are openly worshiping Satan. If you don't believe it, uh, try to find out where to meet sometime. Uh, this is interesting. Have you all noticed that the, the building over here, when you turn off the of Dixie Highway, they have the, what is it, the Christian some Life Center, what's that called? No, what is it? the spiritual whatever center. And that... Oh, they were not Christian Life Center. That's, that's different. That's not the, they're not Satan worshipers. Okay. Uh, uh, but right here on the corner of Dixie Highway, uh, there's a congregation that meets. They used to be in Wilton Manors. And they uh, were they're a Christian science church. But I just was checking out, seeing who are these folks? They've moved in, haven't met them. They have a congregation of about 300 folks that meet on Sunday mornings like we do. Some people have come to our church before and ended up there. Uh, by accident when they're trying to find our church. And they thought very poorly of me and my preaching, actually. Uh, but the reality of it is is that uh, I watched some of their seminars and they were teaching alternative worship and they were teaching Satanism. It's on the Internet. It's on, you know, it's just some of the videos that they've produced and released. And one of the, you know, things that they were teaching was, you know, it was Satanism. It was just open, blatant Satanism. And it's a, you know, for a lot, lot larger congregation than this, than this one right down the street. From here, so do a little research sometime. You say, "Man, I wonder, you know, is Pastor just saying how oh, people are worshiping Satan all over the place?" No, uh, it's very, very open, and it's uh, they're recruiting and it's growing. And so, what I want to say is that naturally, I don't really think that the Scripture is saying that the devil and us we are enemies. The devil, of course, hates us, but we don't really consider ourselves to be the Satan's enemy, do we? I mean, most of us don't wake up thinking, "You know, I hate the devil. I, you know, I, I can't stand him. He's my enemy." Now, if we get the facts about him, we know that what he wants for us ultimately is to destroy our souls. And so he is our enemy. The facts support it, but we just don't have this animosity toward him. I tell you who we really have animosity toward naturally is God. Because the fact is, is that God being who he is and I being who I am, God's right and I'm wrong. And I don't like being wrong about anything anyway, but I surely don't like being wrong about sinning against God and I don't like to bow or to worship. Now, I think our society, particularly because of what we are as Americans, I think that we tend to not bow to anybody anywhere. You ever gone to another country? You ever gone to another country and try to walk like an American? Like you go down the street and somebody's walking towards you and you expect them, you know, I've got just as much right on the street as you do. It isn't like that in other countries. In other countries, it's kind of recognized instantly somebody sees you and you're either richer or poorer or you're, some, you're important or you're unimportant, but you get in your place or you'll suffer the consequences for it. Uh, I, 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 there's nothing like being in another country and coming back on American soil and feeling like if somebody attacked me, I could defend myself. That's just an incredible thing, actually, because it isn't like that in most other nations of the world. The right to self-defense is a uniquely American concept. Did you know that? Go somewhere sometime. Check it out. You'll see what I'm talking about. And uh, so we kind of have an attitude about us a little bit. I'm going to tell you something. Most of you people in this church, if the President of the United States, whichever one you want to pick, the one that's coming, the one that is, or the one that was, were walking down the street, whether you liked him or not might have to do with how, or not, how you treat him. Isn't it so? So if you liked him, but the fact is, is that even the President of the United States could not expect, now his security might try to do something for it, but he could not expect 
for you to give way to him or to give him the place, you know, maybe out of respect. There are a lot of people, wouldn't you agree, in the United States of America, that if they're walking down the sidewalk and the president you know, was coming down the sidewalk and there was only room for one person, they're going opposite directions, most people would expect, I'm not moving for the president. If he thinks I'm going to step into the street for him, he's got another thing coming. Right? I don't know how many times people seem to want to emphasize to me that I'm just as good as you, or actually I'm better than you. <laughs> have you been to a fast food restaurant lately and got terrible service? Where, uh, has this ever happened? You, you go to the counter, and there's the individual who is serving, you know, or they're, they're taking orders, and they don't acknowledge you that you're there. They go, like this, you know? I have... I, I, I guess I'm mischievous in personality. I, I just stare back. Finally they go, what do you want? <laughs> like, and I make them ask you, what can I do for you? Because they do not want to be, they want to be like, I'm just as good as you. And, you know, and, and aren't, isn't somebody behind the counter just as good as me? But they want me to know that they don't have to serve me. You know, it's, it's like there's an attitude like, you know, they finally, they'll just look at you like, and then you give the order like, put it in the machine, you know, put it in the, in, in the, you know, in South Florida we see this all the time, put it in the, in the re register or whatever and then they don't tell you how much it is and you're like, I'm not going to speak to you. Now why would someone not want to speak to me if they have the capability to? They just want to let me know, hey, I'm better than you. I may be behind this counter. I may be having to serve you, but I'm not really going to serve you. And so what can I do for you? How can I help you? Now that ought to be a natural response, shouldn't it? The reality of it is we're that way toward God actually a lot more. I don't know how many people have, been, have expressed to me outrage against God Almighty that God would be so audacious as to expect them to go through His way, His plan, His means, and to bow to Him in order to get to heaven. Why do I have to go through Jesus? Have you ever said that? Why can't I just work things out between God and me? Man, I don't know how many thousands of times somebody's told me I don't mind, you know, I don't mind, you know, acknowledging whatever with God, but I don't see why I need Jesus. Notice what they're saying is, you know, it's mano a mano. It's equals, me against God, and we should be able to duke it out and work it out between the two of us because God's not better than me. Newsflash. God made us. That makes Him better than us. Just from the outset, doesn't it? Okay, so... I don't want to spend too much time, time here. I already have spent more than I intended. And so I want, to, I want to look at this statement in verse 15. I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. Could we say that when we read Genesis 3.15 that when we see enmity, or you're going to be an enemy between Satan's seed and the woman's seed, could we say that the fulfillment, naturally speaking, common sense tells us that the enmity is not between man and Satan, it's between Satan and God? Does that make sense? In other words, there's no one who debates that Satan hates God. He's in a rebellion against God. And that God ultimately is going to judge the Satan, the devil, right? They're, they're enemies. Natural, rightful enemies. Whose side are we on when we're born? Satan. Actually, Satan's side because we're sinners. And sins against God. The Bible says all sin and come short of the glory of God. So we're naturally on the devil's side. So the notion that the logical explanation for Genesis 3.15 is that man and the devil are enemies. That's not what the Scripture is saying at all, is it? Or the woman and the devil are enemies. That isn't what the Scripture is saying at all. Second thing, that's a simple fact, simple truth. you ever been to biology? Uh, and by the way, God understands biology pretty well, having created us. Uh, if you've ever been to biology class, you know that the seed does not come from a woman. The seed comes from a man. That's just the word for, you could say it's the word sperm, but seed. So when the Scripture says the seed of a woman, it's not that the people in the day were ignorant 
about how things work. This is a prophecy of the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. Genesis 3.15, when the Bible says, I will put enmity between the end of the woman, between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head. A bruise to the head is a death blow. It shall bruise thy heel. A bruise to the heel is a temporary wound. And so that's a prophecy of the cross or the death of Jesus Christ. So it's a prophecy of the virgin birth and it's a prophecy of the death of Jesus Christ. So what is God's plan from the beginning of the world? Listen, the first time man sinned, when God gave man his consequences, you're going to labor by the sweat of your brow, the, sin, the earth is going to be cursed. The first thing God did was gave man a sacrifice. Man a sacrifice of a lamb to show him how to be reconciled to himself. And the second thing God did for mankind was that He gave him the promise of a Redeemer that would take care of the worst problem that anyone in the world has. Amen. Try this sometime if you want to share the Gospel. Go to someone sometime and simply ask them, what is your biggest problem? What's your biggest problem? And instantly we go to things we're trying to solve right now, don't we? We instantly think about, well, you know what, I need some money. Or, you know what, I've, this person's my problem. Or this relationship is my problem. But when you ask somebody, what is your biggest problem in life? Most of the time we, we have a near view of things, don't we? A short uh, range view. But what's every person's biggest problem? Death. Death. There are countless people that are trying to solve their biggest problem. Why do you think it is that health crazes make it so well? What are people? Why are people trying to be healthy? Quality of life, Pastor. No, they're trying not to die. They're trying not to die. That's what's happening. They're trying to live longer. They're trying to <coughs> prevent the inevitable. And you know, most people are, rare, are rarely successful at not dying. Did you notice that? Uh, statistically speaking, you know, most people succumb to death regardless of their health. You know, when, if you want to, if you want to uh, be a politician, one of the best things you can talk about is health care. We're going to make sure everyone has health care, and the idea behind it is that somehow, somehow, we're going to give you something that's going to make you live. You're not going to die because of this. In other words, that they, it's a pretty calculated, intelligent political move to talk about health care because that's everybody's biggest problem, actually, isn't it? Did you know that people with health care die also, though? I've noticed this. The mortality rate of hospitals, for instance, is the highest of any place around. And uh, I think it's because dying people go to hospitals. And I think the reason dying people go to hospitals is because people die. That's the biggest problem anyone in the world has, isn't it? It's your biggest problem. It's your biggest problem. It's my biggest problem. Death. It's been a reality in my life. I haven't died yet, but many around me have died. I had a year, a couple years ago, where ten people close to me died in the same year. I mean, it was just like every time I got a phone call, I'm like, I don't, I didn't have, I mean, my heart just hurt so bad, I just didn't even have the emotion to, you know, and, and people want to talk, I was just like, just, just tell me what happened, I don't, just don't want you to talk about it. Just can't, it's just one of the, one of the most hurtful things is the separation that comes from death. Just a reality. You know, it's so much of a reality, it's the biggest problem mankind has. Okay, we finally made a point this morning, didn't we? We finally got somewhere. Why did Jesus come? Why did Jesus come? Because the biggest problem man has is death. And death, the word death, we know in the Bible, is the word separation. Literally, when the Bible uses the word death, it is not speaking of the physical death. It's not, it, 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 speaking of that is one type of death. It's physical death. But real death is separation from God. Enmity is another word that describes death, that is, natural enemy of God. We are dead to God. We're not alive to God. And that's why Jesus came in. Is it not incredible that from the first man that sinned, from the time the first man sinned, God said, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and thy seat and her seat. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. In other words, God's first response to man sinning against him was to give a promise of a Redeemer. I love some of the Christmas songs that we sing and some of the words. You know, as I get older, I pay more attention to words. I actually read the words more and more. 
You ever pay attention to, to the phrase desire of nations? Do you realize that the greatest need every generation has had from the time the first man, the first generation was born, is for Jesus Christ to come? In other words, what is your greatest need? You say, Pastor, I need health. Well, how long will it last you if you get it? How long will you survive? There are people that believe that God wants great health for everybody, and no one who has believed that has ever... Uh, overcome death, physically speaking. What, are, what is every person's greatest need? We need life. But our greatest problem is not that we need money or that we need a relationship or that we uh, need health. Our greatest problem is that we need to be reconciled to God because God is our natural born enemy. And that, my friend, is a problem in which you and I will absolutely lose out. You won't win the battle against God. You want to be God's enemy. You want to fight the war against Him. We've been reading in Revelation about that, have we not? Literally, the nations of the world come out against God, and God speaks their destruction. He doesn't have to raise a hand. It's not an epic battle. The battle of Armageddon, my friend, is the destruction of the wicked. It is not the assault of the wicked on the righteous. There's no contest between God and the Satan. He's God. He created... The devil and his angels, my friend. A created being is not going to destroy its creator. It's not possible. It's not going to surpass, surpass his creator. It also is not possible. Okay, I want to throw out some things then today uh, about what it means. Not only what it means that Jesus came, but what about some prophecies? Or what do the prophecies in Matthew 2 tell us about Jesus? Go to Matthew chapter 2, will you please? You say, Pastor, you should be done right now. Oh, I absolutely should. We're way over on time, and you're probably going to miss lunch. And uh, I'm just as sorry as I can be, and I don't know what to do. So here, just, let's just move on. Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. Uh, now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, you just catch up if you're returning, where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet. Now we were there the last couple of weeks in our Sunday school class, so our teenagers could tell you quite a bit about this. But this is, uh, this is uh, Isaiah chapter 7, where... Uh, Jesus is, uh, the, the birth of Christ uh, has been prophesied. Um, I don't want to get ahead, of, I, I am ahead of myself, and I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. I don't want to give you some notes. I want to throw some things out there if you want to study these things on your own. I want to begin, first of all, by saying, what, by answering the question, what is the evidence that Jesus is God, and what is the significance of the fact that Jesus fulfilled the prophecy of the Scripture about the Messiah? Well, the virgin birth, of course, we looked at the prophecy of that. We, we read the text in Matthew chapter 1 about how that Joseph was told that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. So it is not, she has not been with a man. And the Bible emphasizes, and I'm not trying to uh, be crude here at all, but the Bible emphasizes that Joseph did not know his wife until after Jesus was born. In other words, Joseph did not have an intimate physical relationship with his wife Mary until after Jesus Christ was born. And what the Scripture here is indicating is that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. You say, Pastor, you can't prove that. Nobody can prove that. Well, of course you can't uh, prove that. You can believe it, though. You could believe it if you knew the nature of God. And you could also believe it if you saw the miracles that Jesus did which proved that He was God. Isn't it so? You ever wonder what uh, provoked Mary to say at the wedding in Cana of Galilee? You know, ask Jesus. They run, out of, they run out of wine, and Mary says, Here, Jesus, Jesus, and Jesus said, what do I have to do that they you know, use the word woman with skune in, in the uh, Greek? It's a very respectful term. And uh, so what do I have to do that my hour is not yet come? In other words, he's saying, This is not really what I'm here for. But what did Jesus promptly do? He turned water into wine. The Bible says that the miracles that Jesus did prove that he was God. In other words, Jesus didn't come doing miracles because people's greatest need was to be healed from deafness, from leprosy, from blindness, or raised from the dead in the case of Lazarus or Jairus' daughter or others.
Those things are incredible. What do those miracles that Jesus did do for us? They do for us what they do for Nicodemus. When Nicodemus came to Jesus, he said, Master, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do the miracles that thou doest except God be with him. In other words, the miracles that Jesus did distinguish him from a man. You know, every false religion tries to have a prophet with a miracle. But isn't it incredible that you can't say about any of them like John said about Jesus, that the miracles that Jesus did, if they were written in a book, the whole world could not contain the books that should be written. Every instance where Jesus Christ was healing multitudes of sickness and disease, every single instance of that, there's like a little excerpt thrown into the story, the gospel story, which says, you know, and multitudes came unto him. In other words, John says, I can't write about everything that Jesus did. I can give you a snapshot. I can show you a little bit of something that Jesus did that will show you that he's God. But if I were to write about everything that Jesus did, the world could not contain the books that should be written. Literally, Jesus didn't heal a couple people. Every day, Jesus healed multitudes, thousands of people. You ever wonder why Nicodemus came to Jesus by night? People say, oh, you know, he's a ruler of the Jews, and he was ashamed, you know, to openly profess Jesus. Well, that actually isn't the case. When Jesus Christ was crucified, Nicodemus is the one that, that asked for his body so that he could bury him. When the other disciples had forsaken him and fled, I don't think Nicodemus was ashamed to be seen with Jesus. The reality of it is that Jesus, I think Nicodemus came to Jesus by night because Jesus was so busy in the daytime he'd never gotten access to him. Can you imagine if Jesus came to town today healing every person in town? If Jesus came to town today healing every person in town, uh, and you're going to line up. You're going to get in line. What are your chances? Or it's better get him after he's in bed, wake him up, you know, come here by night. And that's, that's the reality of it. Nicodemus knew Jesus was God. Why? Because of the miracles that he did. How do you and I know he's God? Are we witnesses of the miracles? Yes. Yeah, we are because John said these are written that you may know. See, in other words, we have the Word of God. You can never know Jesus is God without reading the Word of God. You hear me now? Yeah. You'll never be convinced that Jesus is God unless you read the Word of God. And then the Holy Spirit of God will show you that it's a divine book. And that it's not a pack of fairy tales or a book written by a bunch of men. It's a book that God gave by inspiration of the Holy Ghost. And it was written in such a way as to have so many different authors and not a single contradiction in it. In it. And to have the power. Listen, my friend, every day that I get in the Word of God and God speaks to me and His Holy Spirit gets inside of me and grabs my heart and says, that's true. That's God speaking to me. It's not mythology. It's not religion. It's not an earnest desire to believe something. It's real. It's reality. And you can know that Jesus is God. So who is Jesus Christ? What is the significance of Christ's birth? It is not that an influential man was born who taught humanity uh, good things. It's that God was born and He came to die for sin. You read the Scripture, my friend, there are prophecies about the Messiah that have yet to be fulfilled. And they will be fulfilled, but they're prophecies of judgment. And Jesus did not come to destroy the world. I love what He said. I came, he didn't come to destroy the law. He didn't come to destroy the world. He came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. And not only that, but Jesus came to die on the cross for sin, for sinners. Desire of nations. From the time that first the first man sinned, every one of us have been born being the enemies of God and needing a Savior. Genesis traces the genealogical lines of Cain and of Seth. Cain would have been that generation of individuals who were against God, who would not worship God His way. And his descendants would have followed in His stead. Seth's line, after Cain had killed Abel, was traced as that, as that generation of people who sought after God. There have always been people who desire God and who did not desire God. It's a choice that's made. It's an individual choice to either be God's enemy or to seek a Messiah. But friend, if after thousands of years of hoping for the virgin birth to come to place, can you imagine what the culmination of all those hopes and the desires of the nations must have been the day that Jesus Christ is born? When I think of it in those terms, and I think of the angels saying, Glory to God in the highest. Peace on earth. Goodwill toward men. And I think of a God who's man's natural enemy having goodwill toward us. Goodwill toward us. In other words, I'm God's enemy, goodwill towards you. God's response. 
Romans 5.8 impresses me so much when the Bible says, when we were yet without strength. Is that 5.8? Yeah. yeah, it is. When we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. I am overwhelmed and amazed by the reality that God does not love righteous people. There aren't any. But God loves ungodly people. There are people that say, well, God's good. Why does He hate people? God doesn't hate. God loves ungodly. God hates wickedness. And an individual who is set in wickedness and refuses God is a person who hates God and God has to respond to. If He's a just and right judge, He has to deal with His, with his enemy. But God's attitude toward us is goodwill. In other words, you hate me, but I love you. You've sinned against me, but my son who's never sinned, I'm willing to sacrifice in your place so that his righteous life, which he lives sinlessly, could be substituted for your rottenness. That's how much I love you. And friend, if you read Hebrews, particularly chapter 11, you'll see that salvation has always been by faith in what Jesus Christ is going to do. Whether it is looking forward to Christ coming and dying on the cross, or whether it's actually being alive when that happened, or whether it is, as we are today, looking back to the work of the cross. But having a relationship with God has always been because of what Jesus is going to do. And listen, the fact is that God's promise that He is going to bruise the serpent's head with the seed of a woman, coming from God's lips, what, are, what, are, what is the likelihood of it coming to pass? Well, you can believe God, can't you? Has, have you ever seen a promise in the Word of God and you believed it by faith and you acted on it? That's a wonderful moment, isn't it? When you just believe something and you act on it. You know, in other words, I know this is right. It's difficult for me to make a decision on the basis of it, but I'm going to do it by faith. I know I'm supposed to do this, so I'm going to do it by faith. And then you see God honor His Word. What does that do for you? Well, it isn't as though you didn't believe it when you acted on it. But when God confirms, it's a pretty incredible thing. You know, God promising a Messiah, the seed of a woman, is, is good enough for me. Isn't it? If God says it, I believe it, that settles it. I like that. But God's having done it, my friend, is so significant. It's incredible in the first century after the Gospel was preached that those who hated the disciples of Jesus and those who hated the Gospel and Jesus Himself their accusation against them is that these individuals have turned the world upside down. Yeah, literally, the world was turned upside down. You study the Roman Empire, and you look at each of the, of the uh, Roman Caesars and their persecution of Jesus Christ and any of His disciples. The most incredible thing in the world is that anyone would believe in Jesus when you could be put to death for it. This just defies logic and common sense and good reason, doesn't it? All those things are the same thing. Doesn't it just go against the grain? And what, what was the, the thing when one Christian would be put to death in the Colosseum and ten would walk out of the stands having observed it and saying, you know what, that's real. What is that? Well, that's what it is. It's real. And it's a wonderful thing, isn't it, to have the perspective like we do. You know, I can imagine the prophets, you know, the notion that the prophets didn't understand their prophecy a little bit silly sometimes, isn't it? But they didn't see the whole picture like we do. They, they don't look back like we did and said, on this date. Did Charlie go over the date of Christ's birth? Charlie, wake up real quick. Did you go over the date of Christ's birth in Sunday school today? Yeah. Isn't that neat that if you study the Scripture carefully, you can actually come down to the reality of when Jesus Christ was born within a couple of days? The wise men knew exactly when Jesus would be born from Daniel chapter 9. That's just incredible to me, isn't it? God said, okay, the Christ is going to come at this time. And these guys from Babylon waited like 400, almost 400 years. And when it was time for him to be born, the, that generation said, it's our generation, it's time. They saw his star in the east and they came to worship him. Because they knew Christ would be born. It's real. Reality. Don't snore. That, that, uh, that uh, it makes me feel bad. I'm just kidding. I'm just, I'm just messing. All right. Um, all right. That means I'm way, way over time. All right, so the, the answer to the question, two things really I wanted, wanted to answer today. What's the world's greatest problem? The world's greatest problem is that is death, right? We're the enemy of God. The second thing is what does it mean that Jesus Christ came? Well, it means that God fulfilled His promise, and it means that you and I no longer have to be His enemies. It means that instead of looking forward to what God is going to do, 
that we look back at it and we can rejoice in it. And I ask you, has there ever been a more significant event since the creation of the world than the coming of Jesus Christ? Absolutely not. Not in your life. This is, this is, this is an important time for us as believers, isn't it? It's an important time of the year. Christmas means a lot of things to different people, doesn't it? But what is Christmas? Well, it's a celebration of Christ's birth. And the significance of that, my friend, you, you couldn't begin to exhaust the possibilities of ways that it's the greatest thing that's ever happened in the world. And so we as believers ought to be rejoicing. This ought to be a time in our lives when we look at events in life and we say, you know, that's a big deal. Actually, not so much compared to the reality that Jesus came. You know, that's a big problem. Actually, not so much compared to the reality that Jesus Christ came. And you know, when you have that perspective, everything pales in comparison with problems. And actually, if you ask me the practical question, Pastor, what is your problem? Well, there's a sarcastic retort, but then the reality of it is I actually don't have any. I'm good. Everything I need, everything I need I have in Jesus Christ. Amen. Because Jesus Christ came. Hallelujah. And that's true for each of us, isn't it? If you know Jesus as your Savior. Do you know Jesus as your Savior? Have you trusted Jesus? Do you know Him? See, it's really easy. It's really simple. You know, Jesus said about coming to Him that it's like a child. And what He's talking about isn't that you, you know, only children can come to Him. What He's saying is, it's like a child. You can tell a child something that's true and they just believe you. You don't have to prove it. You shouldn't lie to children. Just tell them the truth. You know, children never have a problem believing there's a God. Never have a problem believing in Jesus. I remember being a child when I finally realized I actually was a sinner because I wasn't convinced until I was uh, for several years after I became a known liar and thief. I remember just coming to a place, being challenged about being lost and just coming to a place and ultimately the result was that I just prayed and said this to God. Not these exact words, but this is what I, what I said to God in my heart. God, I know I'm a sinner. I'm your enemy. I, I know I need Jesus. And, I'm asking you to save me because of what Jesus did. Salvation is a gift, and a gift is received by taking it, by accepting it. I know I'm a sinner. I know I need Jesus. I want Jesus to be my Savior. And my friend, God saved me just for that. The Bible says, Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And it means precisely what it says. So if Jesus isn't your Savior, my friend, he, God, wants, God wants Him to be. God gave Him for you. God loves you very much. And so today could be your day of salvation. If it, you've already been born again, then this is just a time of the year where you recognize, I have everything I need. All I need is Jesus. God, I thank you so much for the reality and the simple truth of this. And Lord, we're in the midst of a group of people that are just rejoicing and celebrating. And God, I pray that this would be our perspective for this Christmas season. Lord, that we would be reminded that there's nothing that's lacking, nothing that we need that we do not have because Jesus is all we need. We praise you and we ask that you would make this a very, very special Christmas for each of us as we celebrate Christ's birth. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, thanks for your great attention this morning. I know it's, it's somebody didn't turn on the air conditioner in here. I think that was me. And it's a little bit stuffy. Yeah, but you've, you've been fantastic. God bless you and Merry Christmas. You're dismissed. Merry Christmas.